Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. My guest today is James McIntosh. Hi, James. Welcome to my channel. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me here. What are you knitting? What am I knitting? I'm doing a jumper. I absolutely love jumpers. So I'm doing another jumper. I've got some more complicated knitting where I need to think and count stitches, and that's not good for interview, but basic stocking stitches, brilliant as I chat. So I could just get a few more rows done. You are self-proclaimed fidgeter. Yes. How did you discover knitting? It's quite a long story. It's a very interesting one. Um, I had a, quite a big career in the food world. I became quite famous quite young. In, in China, above all places, I used to put on food TV out there. Right. And I'd fly from London to Beijing to record my TV and fly back to where I live in London, in a place called Peckham. And uh, there was just a lot of homophobia back home in Northern Ireland, where I'm from, when I tried to bring business home. And, you know, judging someone on the way that they're made is just, it's just sad and quite cheap, really. And it hurts. And when people say things about you enough, it's really painful. And you start to wear their stigma and their shame and their thoughts and feelings and that together with narcissistic abuse from other people it caused me it put me in bed for a year with depression and I was diagnosed with what was considered what was called a moderately severe depressive episode for about three months of that time I couldn't move my leg down the bed Thomas my fiance he's a he's a doctor and Thomas was able to he was just wonderful he was a great support. I do not know how he kept his job. And when I wasn't working, you know, did the shopping, gave me time, helped me with what needed to be done and did what was required around the house. And one day, I don't know why, but I'd watched all of Netflix and all of Apple TV and all of Amazon Prime and I'd run out of things to watch. And that's not a life. And I just found two chopsticks and a piece of string in the flat. And I looked on YouTube and I taught myself how to cast on. And I, I remember coming home and from under the bed, I, I sort of lifted this chopstick and said, Thomas, look, I've made it something or other. And he said, brilliant. He said, you've done something. How do you feel? And I said, well, quite enjoyed it, really. So he went out and he, he bought me the most, he didn't think, he just bought wool and he didn't know what he was buying and it was wonderful and it was Erica Knight's brand and Erica knows this story and he bought me Erica Knight's, um, it was alpaca, it was a beige colour and I got the big 12 millimetre needles, the big boys and, you know, sort of holding them like this, hadn't a clue, just followed on the YouTube. You know what, I sort of did something. And I remember being on the phone to my mum and she was back home in Northern Ireland and she was really, she was really worried about me through my depression. And she helped me to learn to knit over FaceTime. And I knit the back and then I knit the front and then I knit the sleeves. And then I didn't know how to sew it up. So it was sort of round and round and round instead of mattress stitch. Right. This thing the size of a house. I couldn't read her knitting pattern properly. So what I did was it actually knitted. The resize is too big. So instead of here, it comes out to here. And I can put my arms in it. And it, is, it, it comes out oh, fabulously dreadful. But it lives at the back of my wardrobe as a testimony to my good health. <laughs> because the moths never eat the ugly items, do they? And that's where the whole thing started. And as I knit, I got better. And I got better and I just learned that knitting, knitting was a way to remove the pain in my head and allow me to think and process. As someone who's got a very fast brain, I found a stitch at a time, saved my mind and gave me a chance and got me well again. That's well, what I got into. When it. people think about like life or famous people, right? They mm -hmm. This guy got it easy. Like he is famous. He's traveling the world. He gets to try all these exotic foods. He gets all these experiences that we can only dream about. And when people talk about depression, it's sort of like, and especially probably coming from Northern Ireland, I'm guessing 
it's sort of like just snap out of it like what's you know like mm -hmm. why are you indulging yourself in this thing was that part of your experience was it more difficult to explain because you were famous everything collapsed at once everything for me and I find it the deepest black that I could envisage. And I wanted to smile, I wanted to laugh, and I wanted to feel emotions, but it was all taken away from me. And yes, people do think things about people, but, you know, yes, I had first-class flights every week to China. You know, it was a wonderful life, but it wasn't a real life. Right. It was... A real life is sitting down with someone you love, whether it's your friend, your family, your partner, talking about the good and bad things of the day, sharing a meal together, laughing, finding your own fun and being yourself. But when you're not like to be yourself, you always have to cover with a mask. And it's very hard, if not impossible, to pretend you're straight when you're not straight. And there was a lot of hurtful things said. And I, I, I couldn't snap out of it, either being gay or depression, and my body just shut down because of it. Well, when you talk about mindful eating, like I want to go more in depth on that because oh yes, I hear so much about you know Netflix eating. Netflix. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, people talk about like eating as form of relaxation. What mm -hmm. we found throughout COVID that the more uncertainty there was around, the more we didn't, we couldn't get out, we couldn't do things. It, it's sort of like similar to the being depressed because you are stuck in, in this place and you can't get out, like in that sense, right? And mm -hmm. we found that knitting Shetland lace was meditative for me because I could not think about anything else. I had to concentrate on this like very difficult chart. Whereas knitting just garter stitch, my mind would be wandering in all the wrong directions. What's That's because you're a seasoned knitter and I cannot do garter stitch. I have to do one row and then the other, you know? Um, but like, I, what, what does it mean to you being mindful of your knitting? Well, we, we, we did a lot of look on this because a lot of work in this because I started to get better, better faster than the antidepressants. Would allow. Now, let's be clear, this is my story. This is not for everyone. There is no research on this. But from my story, we find that I was getting well and exponentially well. And I've never in five years now had a relapse in depression. And through that, I lost my mum in law and my mum. And these are seismic events. And my as long as I kept knitting, my head did not go back to where it was. Now, I, I joked, Thomas Milder Half, he's the doctor in the UK that brought mindfulness, a thing called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And there's different types of mindfulness. So MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, he brought that into general um, physical clinical medicine out of psychiatry. And he treats various diseases with it in the hospital he works in. And he does meditate for three hours a day, every day. Well, I can't do that. I, I've got this very busy brain. I'm a fidgeter. I, I can't sit in the present uh, without judging, analyzing or changing it because then I go and think about it and then have to Google it as well. So I have failed at the basic core of what is mindfulness as outlined by its founder, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, which is all about paying attention on purpose in the present moment. And you come back to the breath as your anchor whenever you slip away. So what was actually happening was I was living in the past. So when you Google something, it's because you've had a thought about it in the past, right? So I was living, thinking in the past, and this isn't healthy. You know, you want to be looking forward. You want to be living. You want to be growing. You want to be adapting to your environment. So what I did was um, all wrong. And Thomas was going to do his meditation one night, and I joked. I said, oh, you do your meditation. I will do my knititation. Then I realized that for everything people had said about me and as much as it had hurt me, and you hear about forgiveness and all of this, and I wanted to forgive, but what does forgiveness actually mean? 
You know, you don't have to take it within a religious context. It's a good and healthy thing to do to let you move on to put it in the past, but do it without hate and without anger. But at the same time, anger is good and healthy in certain circumstances at certain levels. So I realized that a stitch is one of my breaths. The next stitch is one of my feelings. The next one is an emotion. And as these stitches are tangible to this knitted product, so too my thoughts and feelings and emotions are real and they're tangible to me. Because everybody had said, snap out of it, you know, you shouldn't be this way, you should be straight, blah, blah, blah. I grew up in Northern Ireland in the 1980s. You know, it was very fundamentally religious and you were damned and condemned for things. And all I was doing was loving. And I really, I was always told that what I thought and felt and how I was, was wrong. But then I felt through knitting that as these stitches are real, so too my thoughts and feelings are real. That If I don't acknowledge them, if I don't be the true me that I was made to be, then I will fall apart because if one of these stitches is broken, the whole thing unravels, all that work, all that beautiful work unravels. So too, if I don't appreciate and acknowledge my thoughts, feelings and emotions, so too, I will unravel. So I wrote a book about it with Thomas. We couldn't get a, see, we did, this was the time, it was a few years ago when mental health was not being spoken about at this time. And it was really brave for me as a man to say, I've got depression. And we, I started putting it on my own personal Facebook and then friends said, I've got it too. And it snowballed from there. And I wanted to knit a jumper, but there were no jumpers for a man that a man wanted to wear that weren't baggy jumpers back then. So I wrote this book. You can see a bit of the cover there called N Nibble. And it has uh, jumpers for, for men and uh, lots of other things to learn to knit and lots of recipes as well, because we like to cook and knit. Well, it went absolutely massive for us. It really did go massive. And I, I only had 20 pounds at that point and I crowdfunded and I raised the money and I knew that I, I had to forgive. And one of the, the biggest things in forgiveness is actually putting your money where your heart and your mouth is, because that, that's the hard bit. So I raised 20,000 pounds to publish the book. And I sent it home to Northern Ireland and I paid my own people that had hurt me to print and publish the book. And it was very important, the printer I chose, WNG Barrett Limited, because they were the printers of the Good Friday Agreement that allowed peace to come to my country. And that gave me freedom. Giving somebody £20,000, which is what, nearly $30,000, is a lot of money. And I didn't have anything else. And I did it and I sent it with love. Did things get easier? Mm, life's tough. Thomas' mum was diagnosed with cancer. I was trying to re get back on my feet. I didn't want to go back into the food world. And I kept joking. I do my meditation. Well, as I kept knitting, it worked. So we looked and there was no evidence, absolutely no medical or scientific evidence of the correct quality for this. So meditation and mindful knitting. Meditation is like the mindfulness-based stress reduction whereas mindful knitting is the whole concept. So I trademarked both of them and we started to build and grow on this. Now, I set up Macintosh because I realized at the age of 40 that I have been given one of the best brand names in the world is my surname. <laughs> and I trademarked it too. <laughs> and I built Macintosh Wool, which is all about natural fibers, pure wool for well-being. And... Uh, there's a discount code I'll send you for your for your listeners from Macintosh. We only sell beautiful pure wools. No plastics, no nylons, no polys, no nothing. If it doesn't come from the land or from an animal, we don't have it. Um, we've just got a beautiful Dunny Gold tweed. All I do is colours. We've got a blue face Leicester. Colours are amazing in Macintosh. Have a look. I won't do a really sell it, but just have a look. You will love the colours. And I hand dye them all outside that window. And this is what mindful knitting has allowed me. It's one thing when you're treating knitting as a form of meditation, right? Something to find peace. 
what pushed you to develop it into the business and go into the hand dyeing business? Because it's not something that you were doing prior to that. It's something like you started at that time. I didn't want to go into the food world, but I again, but I wanted to go into something similar. And I just just couldn't find what I wanted wool wise and I just enjoyed it. And I knew that I could market this and I knew I could work hard at it and I knew I wanted a change in life. And that's why I went into it. I was enjoying knitting and still do so much. Well, when you talk about like, oftentimes when I talk to people who love cooking, right? When you think about Mm -hmm. cooking, it's like a pinch of this, a pinch of that. You put your uh, own likes, dislikes into it. Mm When it comes to yarn dyeing, there is like these two schools of thought. There are people who are scientists who measure every gram and like, it's almost like baking, right? And then Mm. there are people who are artists who just doing the pinch of this and a pinch of that and see what's going to come out of it. What was your journey into yarn dyeing like? What was like? Spent a heck of a lot of money on wool. (laughs) And you played about till I got it right. I looked at what was on the market and I knew the quality of hand dyed wool was far superior to what's available commercially, in my opinion anyway. So I just played to get the colour palettes correct. I started off with one range, which was British Blueface Leicester in DK and four ply. And then I just built up my collections as we went. It's all all repeatable colourways. And then Love Crafts came and said, can we stock Macintosh yarn? And I must say, I was absolutely over the moon and it's now available globally. And I, as a knit now, I just give my thanks for what's happened in three years. You know, by spending the time mindfully, I spend at least an hour a day knitting, just going like this, putting my thoughts and feelings and anger and upset and love and worries and happiness and joy and concerns and stress into these stitches. Knitting won't change, fix the world's problems, but it allows me to focus on mine. And I do believe if you put love and good energy into something, it shows through. I don't live thinking in the past. As I knit a new stitch onto this hand, The future is literally in my hands as I knit. So I put love and peace and joy and success and laughter and happiness and a nice home and a content life into it. And it comes together. Okay, like I have another tricky question. Go on. Since you became a yarn dyer, do you knit with other people's yarn or just your yarn exclusively? Absolutely just mine. (laughs) (laughs) I... You, there's been a few babies, uh, not mine, uh, but friends and families and neighbours' babies. And I wouldn't put a baby in bra- in, in new wool. I, I don't think that's fair on the baby's skin. Um, you need something softer. So I do buy baby wool and baby wool is well done. I will not buy an acrylic product because with climate change, it is plastic. And, uh, you know, so I, I that's why I, I go and buy you know, nice baby wool for for babies. But apart from that, it's just me knitting my wool because somebody needs to knit for the knitting patterns to go with the wool and the whole Instagram and photographic samples and the number of squares I knit. Honestly, it's ridiculous, the tension squares for photography. Well, what do you do with finished objects? So when you finish that jumper, do you always need for yourself do you need for others do you gift it do you put it in that closet yeah. with that? well there's me and there's thomas my other half and he's the same size as me and i joke that he's the best dressed doctor in the hospital and he goes about and does his ward rounds in a white coat wearing um british wool underneath then uh if it's ladies fashions um and lots of accessories i've got a product called floof which is baby alpaca and silk. It's a lace white yarn. And I've done beautiful, sh- beautiful feminine shawls and wraps in it. And there's a cupboard up there and it stays up there after photography. Um, I did knit a sample for a friend um, for her 50th as a present. Um, so yes, I, I keep them because sometimes you want to reshoot them and things. And, you know, if, if, if I do any shows, I, I'll need products to, to show. So that's what I do. Well, you did the TED talk um, relatively recently. 
And what I found interesting from listening to it was that, again, you were sharing your story, but you were sort of encouraging the industry to research it scientifically because you were saying how the true scientific research is not there yet. So mm -hmm. you was that by design? Like, did you go into TED Talk to encourage the industry professionals to research it further? It was a very interesting concept. I worked very hard at this and making mindful knitting and dissertation known. And King's College London, one of the biggest and best universities in the world, contacted me to do a TEDx talk. I got a WhatsApp at 11.30 one night and said, James, would you like to do a TED talk at knitting? This is, you know, for King's College London. I think King's College London, where all the big medics and professors and scientists studied in the world. It was a huge honour. And it took about six months to write. TED is very prescriptive. So it was a TEDx talk I did. And they're very prescriptive on their rules. And if there is no science and you're talking about something like this, you cannot talk about benefits of health and well-being because they do not exist. So I started off defining what is well-being and what is health. And we looked at that. And then, you see, there's one, one research paper in a, in a mid-level academic journal. And it was 2013, and it was the o Journal of Occupational Health, or Occupational Therapy. And they took 3,000 knitters worldwide, and they asked them, does knitting improve your well-being? And they all said yes. Well, it's like asking people who drink a glass of red wine, does the red wine make you happy? Yes. There was no control. There was no trial in it. There was no... There was nothing to judge it against, so therefore it didn't follow scientific rigor. And to get into any of the main journals where these things will be taken seriously, we have to have what's called a randomized control trial and meta-analysis statistical research. And this has never been done for knitting. So if you go and find a load of knitters and say, does knitting improve your well-being? Does knitting make you happy? Everybody goes, yay! Because we all know it does but we have nothing to compare it against scientifically. And this is the problem with knitting. So for TED, I made the TED talk a call to research. And I've had quite a few very interesting conversations going on through email and through in different parts of the world from people saying, oh, there is research. You know, what can we do to improve it? But the industry needs to do it itself. My Macintosh world is very, very small. It's a home-based business. But there are huge wool companies and yarn companies and they have the funds and, and, and you know to, to help on this so it is a call and i'm calling again to let's look at this properly from a scientific research base to work out does it actually help because i know it helped me get off antidepressants it certainly helped me stop smoking i mean i was smoking for 20 years i haven't smoken for two and a half years and i haven't had a craving since because of knitting so well, yeah. when, when you talk about knitting and mindfulness mm -hmm. for me it's sort of associates with like you sitting in your room in the comfy chair and you look at those teachers and you're admiring your knitting and you're enjoying the process can can you have mindful knitting in the group with knitters like can you be social knitter and be mindful i think if you're practicing mindfulness as per what i was mentioning earlier through the definition by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn who invented mindfulness and you're just in the present moment without judging, analyzing or changing, you need to do it on your own. You can have, I've had been to many knitting groups. I really enjoy the fun at a knitting group because it's amazing what can be discussed at a knitting group that you can't have in an ordinary coffee morning. I find that to do mindful knitting correctly, I need to be on my own with no distractions, no radio, no TV, just me with my stitches to put my thoughts, feelings and emotions into those stitches. And that for me is mindful knitting. When you talk about that you need at least an hour a day, there are plenty mm -hmm. of others, and I might be guilty of it, I'm not saying yes or no, who need way more than one hour a day. <laughs> You know, it's becoming almost like the lifestyle and it's like, it's all you do, right? Mm -hmm. 
do you think there is like an obsessive quality to knitting? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's color and fiber, isn't it? And something grows. There is something psychological that just goes on in my head and I want to see it grow more and you shape it and you turn it and you oh <laughs> you know about knitting is it's the world's best kept secret because the sum of the parts is far greater than the whole of the finished object. People go, oh, lovely jumper. I finished this one last night. And people go, well, this is the first time this jumper has been shown. But people will go, oh, it's a lovely jumper. And I'm going, it is, isn't it? And I made it. And you get this boost inside. Of, I don't know if it's dopamine or serotonin or whatever, but a knitter's pride that they keep inside for themselves generally really helps in life, you know, to just, it's encouragement. Uh, it's literally a wonderful thing. And I do knit more some days, a lot more than one hour, but I make sure I do it at least one hour a day, every day to keep my head in the right place. How did knitting change your life socially? I started a knitting group. Um, in a pub at the end of the road. Now I ran that for two years and then COVID hit and I just haven't taken it up again. That was wonderful. Um, when I was scared to get out of the house with depression and I was I was getting better, but I was still, you know, it these things don't have to fix quickly. And by having this group, it allowed me to have a purpose. Um, knitting socially, I knit everywhere. I knit in planes and I've knit in many airports and planes across the world. I have knit in nightclubs. <laughs> we were on it. We're just off a cruise from our holidays. I was knitting on the cruise. I knit on the beach. I knit on the bus. I knit, I knit everywhere because sometimes you just need to get some knitting done, you know, and sometimes you have to get that sleeve finished and sometimes you just need to start that cuff. So I, people just smile at you when you knit. I bring it to parties. I've knitted dinner parties. I was knitting in a restaurant last Saturday. Um, it, it's not rude knitting. It's not offensive. Everybody's got a story about knitting and everybody's got a story about love of knitting. And I bet you they'll say, my granny used to knit, but she never needed a pattern. Of course, she needed a wee bit of a pattern, but we don't need to spoil that <laughs> bit of the story. <laughs> Do you remember like growing up where it was uh, knitting a big problem thing in Northern Ireland? My mum, my mum was a home economics teacher and mum and I have the same degree. And mum taught food and textiles. She was a phenomenal knitter and crocheter and uh, she did a lot of needlepoint as well. And my grandfather, so mum's dad was from Donegal in, in the Republic of Ireland. And he used to work for a company called McGee who were very famous for making tweets. And that's why I brought out my Donegal range, <laughs> excuse me, was to just say a private thank you for the family history on the back of it. And, uh, oh yeah, mum, my aunties, my grannies, everybody missed home. But back then there was very little money and then it was, that's how you got your school jumper, it was home now. Right. So, well, when, you, when you're saying that you need a lot of tension squares, like in general, when you need, are you gravitated toward garments or is the process of knitting more important than what you're knitting? The, the needs of my business are more important than my knitting. And so let's explain. So over here, I have got October's launch for Instagram. So with my Johnny Gall, people, I have noticed on my emails, people don't know what color goes with what, and that's okay. So what I've done, and I'm only halfway through, is every color on every color, right? So here we have um, ecru and gray. Here we have gray on ecru. So you'll see they're completely different. Right. So that's one thing. If these Instagram pictures have to come from somewhere, I can do three of these a day. These two, <laughs> and then if you, people always want to see what the world looks like. So I have pictures of tension squares where, if you can just grab this one, where in here I have got every wool that I have produced 
all knit up as a square. See, so there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And then they get photo uh, photographed and then put on the website. So that, that's a lot of my knitting, doing jumpers and things. This is my pleasurable knitting, but needs of the business have to come first with knitting. Does and knitting ever stresses you out? Yeah. Yeah, you see when you got... Um, <laughs> Um, I knit this way a thrower I don't I can never remember if it's continental or if it's the English method I use English so this uses more energy right I want to do this one the picking way but I can never get the tension right I just need somebody to sit with me to show me so doing this right so when you do a rib the other way it's it's quicker right so I have to do it one by one it just stresses me doing it this way so yes okay how about you and i pop on another zoom and i'll teach you continental knitting <laughs> no because i need you sitting behind me to hold my hands to move the thing to help me to do it <laughs> that's the problem next time but... i'm london then <laughs> you're more than welcome <laughs> i find double moss stitch very difficult very di i always go off do you or can you manage it i mean i've learned at some point and just for the reference, I only have been knitting five and a half years, and I know Excuse that me. you think and you can do that, that lovely job behind you. you. <laughs> yeah. So the the thing that like I learned early on, like the first lesson in knitting, I remember that was fundamental to me. I jumped straight into Shetland lace, pretty much like from get go, and I was doing this like very difficult pattern, um, and I was I kept messing it up and I didn't know if there is mistake in the pattern because it was an antique pattern or if it was something I was doing wrong and this lady who was in the group of these knitters told me just read your lace and it was like this light bulb moment that like if you actually stop knitting then you probably can spot mistake much faster so that was my thing, you know, it's like stop often and admire your knitting and you might be able to spot those mistakes real fast. So, The Knitter magazine have partnered up with me and it launches on the 4th of October and they're knit along for, oh, this is, I was so taken back by this, um, they wanted Macintosh for their knit along for the four issues. So we came up with, this is the kit and... Okay. I've got early release to the pattern and it's the most beautiful shawl and it's a lace pattern. Now, it's not complicated to knit, but I've never knit lace before, so I need to methodically go through it. So it's quite slow compared to stocking stitch. Right. And I'm really enjoying it. So when there's a yarn over, that's very easy to read, but you have to read on this level and then below the level. It's sort of like reading music. So you've got your bumps and your, and your yarn overs because... To knit it, to read the two to get a K two together, you know, you, you need to see what's coming up. So you need to look really closely at your knitting, and I get joy out of that, like what you're saying, because this is my creation, you know. And I think it's like that's what brings pleasure to me when I knit to stop and like see it. Because like if you just knit and you don't look at what you're creating, it sort of takes half of the joy out of it. Absolutely. Nobody else is going to admire it to that level, so we might as well. Well, let's talk about Macintosh um, <laughs> yarns. How do you add new yarn to the line? What what would seduce you into bringing it into the Macintosh? I see things that I want. Um, I don't rush myself. I don't launch something just to launch something. So I've got my blue face Leicester, 100% blue face Leicester, which is British wool in DK and four ply. I've got this range called Fabulous because it is. <laughs> it is uh, blue face Leicester and grade A mulberry silk spun together. And it is, oh, it's in DK and four ply as well. I remember just holding it and thinking, this is fabulous. And that's why I called it Fabulous. And then we've got Cam, which is extra fine merino and uh, cashmere. And it is so soft. It's a it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful product. Um, and then we've got the Donegal Rich Tweeds that I, was the last to long. Oh, and Floof, which is my lace weight alpaca and silk. I've got 194 different colours. Everything is hand-dyed to order. I keep very little stock in the house. 
to everything is hand dyed. So every customer that orders, it is unique to them. I keep my recipes of the colors. So what's on my website, um, that's what you order and then I, I dye it. I'm looking at other fibers. I won't launch anything in 2023, the rest of this year. I'm think I'm looking at September next year for something quite different. And at the size that I'm at, I can do it small. So I don't need to hold a lot of stock, but it does take quite a bit of money and time to develop, photograph, produce three or four patterns to launch. If you're a big wool company, these things are easy because you have the funding, you have the setup, you have the resources. Everything is me. And I love it, but it's just me. So it takes longer and it's slower. So I do it as I can. I go to yarn shows abroad. Um, I was in Venice the other week, so I had to look at the wool shop. And I'm really glad I went. Um, the lady was telling me how her shop was flooded and how she had to redo it. And she she built the cupboards and she's got a pulley system that she can work to lift all her stuff up so it doesn't... Um, so it doesn't get ruined. It was a wonderful story. Just sad with climate change, it's happening. So we had a, I, I just look, I see inspiration and I come up with ideas. Does Brexit make it more difficult for you? Brexit's been very difficult in my life, having a partner who's German, my other half, um, with a definite leave to remain in the UK. Um, it's not straightforward. If I want to sell to Europe, which I've done through myself because I'm small, somebody has to pay the customs and duties and they're expensive. However, because Macintosh is now available through Love Crafts, they're a bigger outfit and they are able to deal with all of that in a different way. So I always recommend my international customers buy from lovecrafts.com. The German edition of The Knitter did a very big interview on me and we did sales were very good from that. Um, Import, because I'm not buying raw stock of fleece, I'm buying ready spun wool to dye. Um, I can get that through a third party, but of course prices have gone up since Brexit. I don't like to get political. Um, but personally, because I grew up in Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement allowed me to be British or Irish or both, I've got two passports and I'm able to keep a European passport. For travel, it doesn't make it much different. Um, I just think we're all better united rather than divided. Okay. Um, does Dr. Thomas ever think that he shouldn't have push knitting on you does he, when he sees the growing stash and when he sees your new, <laughs> new sweater every day? Does he ever... <laughs> Dr. Thomas goes, no, no, wool, no, my house is taken over by wool. This is our, this is my office, right? The room, that side was a spare bedroom, right? Out that window was a courtyard garden. It is now a factory. The kitchen is full of stuff. And do you know what? Dr. Thomas sees me happy. He sees me content. I know he's proud of me and he's proud of what I've done. He said to me a few weeks ago, he said, I'm doing my appraisal for work this year and what I've achieved in the department. And he said, I was thinking about what you've achieved from what had happened. And he said, um, you're an unstoppable machine because you keep working. I'm sorry. And it was, I'm so glad he said that to me. Um, everything I have done, I started Macintosh at 20 pounds. 20 pounds, you can't buy merch at 20 pounds. And there's been, it's not been easy. It's not been straightforward. And we had a very abusive time on Instagram and that hurt me. It really hurt me. And people never sought to see the truth. And I just stayed quiet. And then the people copy my brand names from my world. But you know what? I don't complain about these things. I just keep going and Thomas just keeps encouraging me. I can put a ball of wool on his hand because he's been to so many yarn shows and he can go, oh, there's Merino in that. He listens. He knows it's really quite funny, but he is banned from knitting needles because he's useless at it. Useless. You know what I find entertaining? Like when my husband would watch some show on Netflix and he would be like, did you see that sweater over there? It's crochet, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. But 
it's just like so funny how we like we train them to see those things and like notice it because of us you know <laughs> I find I caught myself for a period of time looking into prams, baby's prams, to see if it was a raglan or a set in sleeve because I was knitting for babies. It was so innocent, you know. And these, the mums were looking at me and said, what, what are you doing? And I was like, but I was genuinely just looking. And, and I look at, at, at you know, how, how, how jumpers are made and designed and bizarre things. Like normal people don't look at, but maybe I am normal now and my new normal. And, Knitters are knitters, and knitters have a different way of thinking, and that's okay. Well, you're talking about not looking back. What's ahead of you? What do you see ahead of you? A day at a time and a stitch at a time. And that's really the core of who and what I am now. I know what I can achieve because of what I've done in the past, but it's not a race and it's not a competition. I want to succeed like we all do and I want to be happy and I want to be healthy and I want to have a good life and I do this one stitch at a time. Things have happened in this past few years that have been good like getting into love crafts like the knitter joining up with me like oh you know two to three magazine articles a month about Macintosh and I just say thank you. And I put my thanks and my gratitude into my knitting because if you don't say thank you and realise it in every fibre of your body while you make new fibre stitches, I think you just become an odd person. You know, I was brought up to say thank you and I wouldn't be where I am without other companies investing in me, you know, and giving me a chance. So one stitch at a time well i hope uh, there is more interesting opportunities in your future and i find Thank that you. with me like i'm always surprised that i don't have a plan i don't know where i'm going with this thing but i'm enjoying every step of it that's it puts new people in my life that i wouldn't meet otherwise and i think that's yeah. the last part of it you know so it is about enjoying it because, you know, when you sit with your mum, I've lost both my parents now, and when you sit with them at the end of life, my dad was 56, my mum was 71, that isn't old for either of them. And you see life move away and move on. You realise that this is not a rehearsal, this is it. This is the game. There is only a definite amount of stitches I can create in my life, and I use that as a metaphor for everything. So I make the most of it and I say thank you. Well, I want to thank you for being my guest today. It was a wonderful Thank you so much for contacting me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, James. Thank you. Thank you. Anytime. Bye-bye.